how do you identify yourself? Okay, so oh, so uh, you're uh, interested, so that you you have a team that. Okay, all right. Um, uh, which of you are working with Java? Okay, uh, my examples are Java, but uh, you have similar tools for other technologies, usually at least, um, and. The tools that I'm going to uh, show are, they're not really the point. The point is having a tool, not the specific tool. So I think uh, we're fine. Uh, just out of curiosity, what other technologies are, do you work with other than Java? Ruby. Ruby? Yeah. Ruby on okay. Ruby? Uh, Groovy? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, in certain communities, uh, the apparently the 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 way of living is that you always build your own tools. Uh, I've understand that C and C plus plus generally go in that direction after some like fundamental tools like the compiler is in place and. Uh, some other communities like Java, they, uh, you know, perhaps the, the usual way of working is you take the latest, like, uh, popular build tool, but you never touch it. Like you, you just take what comes out of the box, but you don't really extend the tools much. Uh, yeah, I mean, the point is uh, the purpose, not, not the, the way you're getting there. Uh, I guess it's... Uh, it's uh, 30 past, so we, we should get started. Um, I'll first uh, uh, tell you a bit about myself, uh, mostly about my background. So I've, I've been um, earning a living doing uh, software stuff for uh, more than a decade. I've been uh, writing code for uh, longer than that. And uh, even though for the past maybe seven, seven years, eight years, I've been mostly uh, sort of working around methodology things, um, uh, training methods. I'm also a certified Scrum trainer, but don't count that against me. Um, I've been doing a lot of non-programming work recently, but I also do still I frequently work with teams, uh, usually not full-time uh, for a long time. I might be there for two weeks, Full time, uh, but then I might be away for a year, so it's uh, quite somewhat different than working full time and being uh, uh, mentally committed to the team. Uh, but my background is is in programming, and uh, Reactor as a company where I work, we I, we do software delivery. Um, most of the book, uh, the, this talk is actually based on uh, the, the latter book, the Effective Unit Testing, which just came out, uh, Chapter 9, which is called Speeding Up Test Execution. Now, the title is a bit different than this talk. Uh, we're going to talk about both uh, speeding up your test, because that's, uh, especially in Java, uh, a lot of, uh, about your, your build speed has to do with uh, how many tests are you running, what are the tests doing? Uh, how are you running those tests, and so on? So it kind of tends to uh, revolve around test execution speed in certain technology technology environments. Uh, in others, it might be compilation or or things like that. Um, so if you want to learn more, you can also get the book and, and uh, get a, a bit more elaborate description of some of these things. Uh, the the book is also a collection of test smells. Um, and I'll be talking more about that tomorrow. Uh, but we will look at a few test smells that relate to performance in terms of test execution speed. So kind of like a two-pronged approach. Uh, here's the session outline. Uh, we'll start by sort of first making sure that we all sort of speak, uh, with, or may, we might be speaking with the same words, but we, we also understand uh, what the purpose is that I'm talking about when, when I talk about speeding up a build and why, why it might be important. Um, then we'll look at quickly at uh, simple ways of profiling our build. And once we sort of 
figure out where the where the problem is, where, where the hotspots are, or the bottlenecks. Uh, then we talk about optimizing test code and uh, tweaking the infrastructure, which is more about how you're running tests than what the actual tests are doing or what the actual build is doing. Good. Um, please ask questions on the on the fly. Uh, we should have uh, we should have time for questions, and uh, just. Uh, Give me a shout or raise your hand. Uh, if I don't see your hand, then, then give me a shout. Um, let's start with the, the impact of build time. So, uh, my, uh, so if I've concluded that there's no way around it. If the build is slow, it's, uh, it's a shitty situation and you, just, you, you can try to ignore it, but it will come back to you. So, there's, there's two ways to sort of try and deal with it. One is to just, well, wait for the build to finish. It's going to take uh, you know, 20 minutes, so I'll get coffee. I, co I come back, I read a paper, uh, look at the build, it's still running. Okay, I'll, I'll go get another coffee. Uh, I'll, uh, you know, I'll check uh, the websites, what, what's on. And eventually, uh, you'll get a result. Now, that's uh, regardless of the build result, whether it you know, passes, everything seems to be okay, or it, uh, or it fails, there's a you know, compilation error, there's a, a test failure, whatever the reason, uh, whatever the result. In any case, all of that time has been wasted. Because you didn't actually learn anything during that time, you didn't produce anything during that time. It's kind of complete waste. So naturally, if the build is going to take 20 minutes, you're, you're going to uh, move on. You might, be, might trigger the build, uh, uh, trigger it off and then start working on the next thing and you know most of the time that might be okay because you know the odds are if you're uh, if you're quality aware you you have decent en engineering practices uh, most of the time you, you you don't make mistakes but then every now and then you know 20 minutes later you'll get that uh, nasty context switch something failed and it's already been 20 minutes so you can't quite remember what what did I do? What did I change? Uh, you know, you have, might have to revert your uh, workspace back to that situation uh, and start debugging. So even that kind of uh, approach does has its downsides. Either option has something something very wrong with it. Of obviously, the best solution would be to get rid of the problem altogether, uh, having a, a, a less slow build. So uh, I'd like you to grab a piece of paper, any piece of paper, um, if you have, because I, I'd like you to make an explicit guess about some of the things. Um, any piece of paper, you don't have to pass it on. It's just for yourself so that you remember the numbers that I'm going to ask you uh, to uh, you know, estimate. So uh, here's the situation. There's a programmer, he's working on, on some code, he makes a mistake, and then sometime later he notices, uh, realizes the mistake and fixes it. Now the question is, um, how much uh, in cash does fixing the, or making and fixing the, co the, the error, how much does it cost if the delay is one minute? I make the mistake, 60 seconds later, I see, ah, I made a mistake, let me fix it. What's the cost? Write it down. Some kind of currency. For me, it would be euros, but for you, it's probably uh, something else. How about five minutes later? What if the delay is five minutes rather than one minute? How about one day? You go home, you come back to work next day, and then roughly, uh, roughly eight working hours after you made the mistake, you might have slept the uh, uh, night in between. You know, you find the problem and you fix it. How much does it cost then? Do you have all three numbers so far? Uh, final, uh, final question. What about one week? If it takes a whole week before you notice the problem and fix it, how much does it cost then? Uh, 
Um, so uh, I'm curious, what, what kind of numbers did you get for, for the first situation? Uh, it cannot be zero. It cannot be zero. You made a mistake and you had to do rework, so it cannot be zero. It can be zero point some, something, but it cannot be zero. Near, near, zero. near zero, yeah. What's the highest uh, value, highest cost that you estimated? But within within one, if you fix it within one minute. Oh, okay. So what, what's the highest uh, estimate for the one minute in your scenario? I've estimated one euro. One euro. Okay, so we have uh, we have near zero one uh, was it one euro, yeah. uh, ten dollars something around that area maybe. Oh yeah, uh, too much details. <laughs> That's too much detail. Yeah, but I mean this is an imaginary situation, of course. I mean, Yes. Well, that, that's an interesting perspective. I, I think there's uh, there's a point, and uh, if you let, let's go a bit further and see if if that changes our the way we talk about this. So, what what kind of numbers did you get for this the five minute option? Ten euros. Ten euros. So ten times your previous. What, uh, what about others? About three times the previous. Maybe three times the previous. So it's not not quite linear, but roughly one, like roughly linear to the the first one. So why, why isn't it the same cost? It's the same mistake you made. It's uh, likely the same fix that you apply. Why is the cost this uh, bigger? There's a bigger context change, yeah? Yeah, so we start, start having the, like, all kinds of possible uh, consequences of making this mistake and letting it leak outside from our uh, out of our fingers into the maybe version control, maybe to other people's workspace, and so forth. So, just out of curiosity, what, what's the number for one day? 300. 300? 100? 50 yeah. times. So, another magnitude more. Uh, what about one week? 300 times? Well, yeah, we're just starting to talk about thousands of dollars, euros, something, yeah. Well, this is, the, this is a, a general bug. You know, bugs are, uh, bug is a nickname for programmer mistake, right? But, uh, you know, I, I'll, uh, maybe this helps you. So Google, uh, Google does a lot of software development. And they've done uh, they've done data mining on on their their actual version control system and and bug ticketing systems and so forth. So uh, th there's a guy called Mark Strybeck who uh, a few years back he he, he dug into this thing and he tried to figure out uh, what's the cost of uh, their quality or lack of it. So he looked into this. Uh, uh, the, so the delay between introducing a bug and fixing it, or introducing a mistake and fixing it. And uh, he came up with these estimates. So uh, the, the range was from 5 US dollars to 5,000 US dollars, depending on uh, how long the delay was. And, and you know, some of them were quicker, some of them were uh, like slower fixes, but this was the sort of statistical uh, average or, or or a mean. I'm not sure which was it, uh, but there's a there's a big impact in terms of cost, and 
you know, you, you got fairly similar estimates, at least some of you who, who voiced them out loud. So clearly there's something going on. At the one week level, we, we could imagine that other people get involved. But already within, uh, within minutes, there's, there's some kind of a difference. And within hours, there's a significant difference. So uh, I, I think this, uh, this might not be as big an issue for, for one organization uh, or the, the other. Uh, for Google, uh, they calculated that it's roughly $160 million per year if they could uh, so, sort of crunch those uh, delays near, near zero. I mean, they can't prevent mistakes being happening, uh, but they, if they catch it within a nanosecond, the cost is practically zero. Um, so that, that's, uh, I think that's, uh, that was a surprising number for me. But then I started look, I, thinking about these, uh, uh, the delays and, and realizing that, yes, it actually it's really hard to go back and, and start debugging because I, I need to reestablish the context. So I need to read a lot of code again and uh, go back and forth. So the delay is really important. I, I think that's why we should be relentless in trying to, to fix the delays, uh, shrink them, and uh, sort of uh, give developers, uh, give myself primarily, but also uh, the people around me, as quick feedback on, on the software's health as possible. So uh, that was, that was, I wanted to sort of point out the, the monetary aspect that there's, there's, an, there's a very immediate impact on, on the cost of development when there's a delay involved. And this, the, uh, the length of a build, the duration of the build, it does impact the delay because if the build takes 20 minutes, it might be that it's the very last thing in the build that signals the failure. Now, if we're constantly observing the log, we might notice that, oh, some test failed. Let me like, scroll a bit up and see which test. So you, you might find ways of you know, getting that information out early, but every now and then it, it will be the, last, the very last thing that fails. So uh, talking about profiling the build, um, you know, there's this, uh, this uh, Kind of dilemma. We we think we're we're optimistic and we think that we can, you know, shoot in the dark, and you know, guess right. We have intuitions about why this build is slow, but unless we're very very lucky, or we actually look at it, um, we're not quite sure. We shouldn't be sure, uh, especially because it takes it takes so little to verify where the time is going. And what the proportions actually are. Is it, is it compilation? Is it packaging? Is it running tests? Is it running this kind of test or that kind of test that is slow? And, and how slow it actually is. So uh, when, we, when we're profiling a build, what we want to do is basically three things. Figure out what's the total delay. Um, and we want to figure out you know, where does that delay come from? Where's the biggest, uh, where does the majority of the time go? And uh, possibly in the maturity, there might be the biggest potential. Although we might end up uh, realizing that actually it's the compilation that takes the, uh, the biggest time. And we've already looked at it. We can't really figure out a way to, to compress that time any further. So maybe the biggest potential is actually the second biggest chunk of the build time. But anyway, we need to, we need to figure out all of these three things somehow, and I, I'll uh, show you a few, few simple tools for, uh, for the sort of Java environment, Java community tools. So the first one is uh, uh, built in, sorry. So there's, uh, in Ant, there's, uh, there's a tool called uh, uh, Profile Logger. So I have a bunch of uh, sort of short demo scripts because, uh, you know, I can't rely on the network. Some of the tests actually use a remote server and so forth. But I made these uh, demo scripts that uh, essentially, if they don't have a log file from a previous run that I could just display, they, they run, the, uh, run the build with certain tool, certain options and uh, capture the output for later reference. 
So uh, here, for example, we have uh, we're running ants with and with an option logger, org Apache blah blah profile logger. And so if I if I actually execute this uh, this script, um, we can see roughly what it does. So uh, it would run the build. Uh, now I, we're we're skipping that because we have a cached result here. And then I've picked up uh, a few interesting lines from the, the result. So uh, when you enable this option, or this profile logger, uh, in your build output you get these reports. This uh, build step or build task in and, and terminology, uh, it's, it was started here and it finished here. And the total, uh, the total duration for that was uh, something. So just by looking at these numbers, you could see that, well, uh, JUnit task uh, started, oh, sorry, uh, lasted uh, 100 seconds. And then there's a, a target called test execution that lasted 100 seconds. Well, well you, if you know the code base, you probably know that you know, these, the test execution target just does the JUnit task. So they're, they're actually the same thing. Uh, but clearly, you see that this is where the biggest the maturity is, and also you might reason that there, that's where the biggest potential is for optimization. Another tool is uh, 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 an ant, the uh, ant performance listener. So similarly, you, you just configure or pass a different parameter to ant. This time, you have to use the ant contrib library, which is an open source extension library for ants, and you, uh, you basically register a listener called net sf ant contrib blah blah ant performance listener. And the difference is basically uh, just in the sort of aesthetics of the output. So I've run this on a, on a project I called OOP tw uh, 2013. Um, but it, it basically reports the target level uh, stuff and not the target and task level things mixed with each other. So this might be more clear to you uh, because you don't have to do so much uh, sort of uh, deduction in your in your head. Oh, that's that's a task and that's a target and actually those two are that's inside that. So you don't have to do that mental juggle that much. Also, if we if you actually look at the uh, and output for and profile logger, there's a lot of uh, white space in between those uh, those reports. So this is actually cleaner to read. It's easier to read. Uh, for uh, Maven, there's also a tool that I I build because I realize that there's there doesn't seem to be a tool available that does similar things for Maven. Um, so you can enable a build extension in Maven. Uh, so add this bunch of XML to your massive XML. Um, and per pretty much then you get a similar result. Um, um, I'll uh, give you a snapshot of that as well. So uh, at the end of the build, when the build, once the build is about to complete, it basically uh, spills out this uh, sort of unified report saying, here's the uh, here, here's the, the project that, that I ran. So if you have a multi-module project, it actually lists all of the modules separately. Um, and within each, each project or module, uh, there's, there are different phases in Maven terminology. And within each, uh, each phase, you, have, um, you ex execute plugins or, or uh, mojos in, uh, in uh, Maven -like lingo. So here, for example, we have the, the whole module took uh, roughly 70 seconds, and uh, that's 100%. Out of that 100%, uh, process resources phase was uh, trivial, compile phase was trivial, uh, test phase took 95% uh, of the time, and uh, the only thing we ran inside the test phase was the, the sort of Surefire plugins test mojo uh, executing tests, basically. So uh, for, a, for a more complicated build, this would be, uh, again, slightly easier because you can look at the percentages rather than uh, deduce the, the importance of numbers yourself. Yeah. Uh, Maven build utils. 
Um, oh yeah, that's there it is. Um, so th these are some tools, and, and uh, I'm I'm fairly certain that uh, most sort of technology platforms have at least the ability to sort of get that information out of the standard tool set. Um, you might have to code a little or script a little, but it, it should be fairly easy. So let's uh, let's focus on uh, the the two sort of two ways of making this making it fast once you know where to focus. So let's imagine that it's test code that we want to to speed up. Um, why uh, do you think tests might be slow? What kind of things you've observed yourself? Set up, tear down. Set up and tear down. So you're doing, uh, doing non-essential, like useless or, let's say, unnecessary setup or? Yeah, usually, uh, you know, people have the tendency to write big setup, big tear down, and use it across many tests. So okay. Yeah, so if you can find a way to safely do things just once, that would, uh, obviously, that would, have, that would mean less uh, statements to execute, less work for the CPU might be less work for the, the I.O., the disk, and, and so forth. Test data. Hmm? If, if, if there is an integration test in generating test data, mm. migrations, running those migrations, takes time. Yeah. Anything else? Requiring other external servers. I have seen that unit tests or a test that runs on external servers are talking to their server because that's a prerequisite. So, uh, so third-party servers are notorious because it, usually th there's a there's a long thin pipe, and then you have to push all those zeros and ones there and wait for them to come back. It might be really slow. Yeah. So you could also turn that around if you can run them in parallel. That would speed up your build. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it's artificially sort of sequenced. Uh, you could easily do things more uh, in parallel. We'll talk about more about that in, uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, these are some reasons. I've collected a, 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 the sort of sum under two categories. One is that the tests are doing too many things. Um, so they're doing unnecessary things. And uh, sometimes they're, they're doing things that are useful but they're slow. So for example, the, like the remote server, it might, be, uh, it might be something that's essential to the behavior that you want to test, but actually accessing the server, just, that, that's just slow. So if you can find a way to do it faster, that would, uh, that would be better. Um, if you can avoid it and still retain the, the meaning in your tests, that would also be better. So here's a few examples. Uh, test doing too much, uh, setup that's not relevant, uh, doing too much computation when you could basically use a more sort of uh, I don't know, evolved input to start with. Um, repeating the same thing, uh, slow objects versus you know, less slow objects. But then there's example of slow things. Some of these we, uh, we sort of covered, some things we didn't, but I think you've seen this a lot. Uh, tests that have thread sleep calls or uh, whatever the API is in your language. How many has uh, written one of these? I have. Yeah. Uh, the, the, it's like, uh, that's the Band-Aid. If you, if you have something that deals with threads, the, the easiest way to write some kind of a test is to just spin it off and wait for a, a long time, long enough that it's, it's fairly likely that you know, whatever you spin off uh, manages to complete before you make checks or assertions. Uh, but then there's uh, the, the networking stuff, uh, doing network access, uh, databases, and file systems. These are r the three things here are usually they go together. The reason you access a file, a file system Sometimes it's because you're accessing, accessing a database that uh, has the data in, on a disk. Um, sometimes it's really uh, like a file system, file system access. Um, also networking usually relates to some kind of a database. Sometimes it's a web service or 
uh, things like that. But a lot of the times that I've seen the network connection is actually for accessing a database. So uh, I'd like to show you examples of uh, a few of them. And uh, there's, uh, there's uh, I think, an intellectual challenge there um, with one of them. So let's, uh, let's start with the, uh, an example of a setup that does too much. So here's, this is a, like a made up example, uh, a trivialized example from something I've seen a lot. And uh, the dirty word here is Spring Framework. For some reason, uh, Spring tends to come with this, uh, this result. So there's, uh, there's a bunch of abs abstract classes because your components, the classes you're testing, uh, they, they want dependencies, and the way you uh, get those dependencies is through this uh, dependency injection framework. And uh, you define kind of a context so that the framework knows how to connect these objects so that everybody's dependencies are met. And usually it's, uh, it's an XML file. Sometimes it's an an uh, annotation uh, or annotations on the objects. Luckily, that's starting to be more common. But in any case, doing this stuff takes a while. Um, reading the XML from somewhere, parsing it, or just running through your, uh, uh, your, like, your bytecode, looking for the certain annotations, and then wiring things up. It, it takes some time. Now, uh, there's a, here's a test that extends from the, the abstract class. And it actually uses the context to get some bean. Uh, supposedly, we're, we need it for this test. But then there are other tests um, that don't really need Spring, uh, so they don't extend from it. Now, if we run this, um, we can see that, where it go? There. Um, this is roughly the overhead. It seems to be roughly the overhead of the, like reading the Spring context. Uh, this is the fast test that doesn't extend the base class one millisecond roughly, and the other is almost a second. Uh, it's not quite true because there's a, there's a class loading cost that only occurs once. So if I'd, uh, uh, if I'd run two of these, the second would actually run much faster. So let's do that, that as well. Um, place her for this two, just to uh, see roughly what the difference is. Um, so it's, uh, it's not actually that bad. But if, if you compare to this, that's like, like eternally slower. So uh, these things would add up. And if, you're, if all of your tests deal with spring, uh, how, just count the number of tests you have. If, it, if it's 1,000 tests, uh, no, 10,000 tests, that's starting to add up to your build. So uh, that's interesting. Uh, but then the problem with these uh, inheritance-based you know, setup uh, utilities is that one, so at some point, you have the need to do something with uh, like a slightly different uh, common aspect of your, your uh, sort of framework world. Let's say it's locale. And, the, and you create a, an, a nice little utility base class for locale stuff. Uh, and of course, because you need the uh, the spring context stuff in general, so you extend that from the, the general spring test base. And you add uh, whatever the uh, local specific stuff is. But now when you, when you want to write a test for something that deals with locale, the, the easiest way to do that is by extending this class, even if you don't really need the, the spring stuff. And then you, you sort of take that into your test, even though that's not strictly necessary. But because this is the easiest way to do it, uh, people end up doing this. So uh, pay attention to this. It's, uh, it's a fairly common smell. Um, another uh, another uh, example. Here's, a, here's a, a, again, an imaginary socket listener test. Uh, the idea I got from some code that I wrote roughly 10 years ago, uh, it was awful. Um, and I, I, I just found this on my hard drive uh, and, and curiously looked into it. And I find all kinds of ugliness, including uh, these thread sleet tests. So here's uh, the idea is that you, you, you have a, a socket listener that's 
listening on some kind of a socket connection. And then uh, uh, you, you, you start the thread where the listener works. And then after a while, something should, should happen. But you're not quite sure when. So uh, if we want to know uh, what, uh, what the listener sort of is, uh, is doing, um, we, need to, we need to do a lot more work than just start a thread and wait for a second. Um, so in this case, we're, we have a test that uh, starts and stops the, uh, the, the listener. Uh, we know that zero milliseconds isn't, isn't enough. Uh, we've concluded that, well, if we wait for a whole second, that at least seems to be more than enough. So let's put it at one, one second. Uh, and then after stopping, uh, perhaps the same thing. It might not stop immediately. It might still have some tails to finish. Um, and what we'd really want to say is uh, something like this. Uh, we wait for the, the threads to start up for a maximum of one second. But please give me back control. Give me, continue my execution as soon as you can, please. And for that reason, we might want to use uh, some kind of uh, uh, utilities, like maybe create some kind of an observable thread or uh, inter, uh, expose synchronization objects uh, so that you can, you can t talk to your socket listener and say, uh, please notify me when this, uh, this step has been done. And please notify me when this other step has been done. And maybe uh, you can then uh, pull on those events and then do the, the assertions. So again, uh, just to point out what the difference is, we're pretty sure that sl uh, sleeping for a second is pretty much exactly one second. Since we did two of them in the, in the test, uh, the whole test takes two seconds. And here's the, the, the same test uh, logic, the same production code we're testing, uh, but clearly we've saved almost two seconds by returning control as soon as we can. Now that's going to be slightly different uh, if you run this over and over again, but it's always around this area. Um, so th just to point out that this is, uh, this is code that you, you need to write. It's not complex code, but it, 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 it is an extra effort. Uh, I think it's it's well worth it if you're doing anything with threads. Now, the final uh, of the three examples I'd like to use is networking. Um, this is a situation where you have some kind of widget that shows uh, stock tickers, like the latest stock value for, I don't know, Apple or Google or, or Facebook. Uh, and there, there's, there are two components. Uh, one is the, uh, the sort of stock ticker, the widget. So that's what we're, uh, that's what we're actually um, sort of uh, testing here. We have two, we create two kinds of inst instances of that. Uh, one we create for uh, sort of presenting the stock value of Apple stocks in this view um, using the, the real live source from somewhere in the internet. So maybe it's in an intranet, but like, over the network anyway. And then we, we do the exact same thing, except we use a stubbed out source, which uh, over here, it's, it's actually a mock object. Yeah. Um, then uh, what do you think might be the difference? Big one. Big one? So let me point out, the, the external remote server, it's not that remote. It's running on this laptop. Uh, so it's actually created here. Uh, let me just show you quickly that uh, the fake stock server um, it only does one thing, uh, you know, offer one API stock quote for a certain, uh, certain stock name, uh, and it renders uh, a small piece of XML back. It's, uh, it's run using uh, um, the, Jetty, the Jetty web server. So it's an actual production quality web server that we're running in process uh, uh, over a fairly quick network connection. So it's not that bad. But uh, I'd like to hear your, your estimate on how long will these tests last. If I run these, uh, fetching over HTTP. Uh, 
the starting and stopping is not part of the test. It's done as part of this. It's part of the setup. So we're we're talking about just the test logic, uh, firing off a request, getting it back, and pushing the response to a, a view of some kind. So what do you think might be the uh, the duration of making that very simple HTTP, HTTP call? Any guesses? Probably we're talking about milliseconds, not seconds. But how many milliseconds? One is to ten. Sorry? One is to ten. Or? So the difference between the... the, the difference is like one to ten yeah. between these two types. Uh, uh, which is the slower one? Yes, obviously the, the server will be slower. So let's, let's see. Um, we're, we're making three, uh, we have three tests just to point out that you know, there's, a, there's the class loading cost that incurs just once per JVM. Um, so fetching the uh, stock quote over HTTP is more than a second. Uh, fetching stock info using a, a stub or a mock object is eight mil, uh, Eight milliseconds, but actually if the second fetch over HTTP is just two milliseconds slower. Effectively, the same uh, the same performance as using a stub. Interesting. So I mean, it's this kind of this kind of things why you should per profile your tests before you make uh, make conclusions, because we all know that networking is slow. We all know that file access is slow, but it's not always the case. Um, the fact that we use the mock object library here to, to create the, the, the stubbed out uh, source for the stock info, uh, mock object libraries use reflection. Now, reflection is also slow. So unless you're doing uh, really like manually writing stubs, uh, they're probably around the same performance. Uh, of course, depending on what the service is doing. If, if this was an actual service somewhere, they'd do a lot more processing than our, than our uh, little fake stock server here. Uh, but this is interesting. Networking isn't always that slow. So uh, let's go back to the presentation. So we had these uh, examples of uh, uh, tests doing too much, tests doing too slow things. Uh, some of them might not be that slow. But uh, these are all uh, things to keep in mind in that demo we just did. So uh, I'd like to spend uh, the rest of the talk talking about uh, how we run these tests. So first of all, once we, when we start optimizing, we should again know where to focus on. So we should like profile where the bottleneck is. Uh, in like, trivializing this a bit, it could be CPU, the bottleneck, or it could be some kind of input output. Um, if you're running a, a Unix system, you, you have these tools like uh, top. It's not really made for this purpose, but it's, it's useful enough. If you trigger off your build and you, you, you run top, to, uh, the CPU usage pretty much tells you, you know, if, if the CPU is bottleneck, then it's uh, at 100% or you know, 200% if you're using two cores and, and, and so forth. Uh, so that's you typically, well, CPU is the bottleneck. If you can reduce computations, uh, that's an immediate improvement. Uh, you could use uh, a look at the idle time report here, which uh, suggests that the CPU is waiting. So it's at least not all the time the bottleneck. Uh, you could look at the sort of system calls metric, uh, which doesn't technically mean uh, file access or I.O., but most of the time, it correlates with uh, the code doing a lot of I.O. Most of the system calls tend to relate to networking or, uh, or file access. So uh, if that's rarely at 100%, but if it's like uh, high double digits, it sounds like I.O. So once you know this, let's say it's uh, the CPU is the bottleneck. Uh, some of the obvious ways are, are using more hardware, but how exactly? You could add CPUs. Um, uh, y y that might mean like, getting a build farm and sort of uh, distributing it even more massively than, than just within one computer's course. Uh, that's, that's clearly one option. 
Um, the simplest one might be to just make sure that you're using all of the cores on your computer. Um, so one of, one of the demos I did was uh, this sort of parallel test thing. Um, so the difference between POM XML and POM parallel test XML, the only difference here between the two runs is I've uh, explicitly said, please use multiple threads. In this case, exactly two. Um, I just throw in uh, two because I happen to have two cores on my laptop. Uh, and the difference in the execution times between parallel and, and serial execution, or let's say parallel and non-parallel, um, is almost linear to the number of cores. Yeah? If the code is essentially single thread, how would this help? How would, uh, how would the multi-core help you? Because, uh, because the, uh, the, the JVM can say, uh, you, Mr. Core 1, please run this stuff. And you, Core... So uh, what you should probably do is start with something, and the number of cores available is a pretty good guess. But then start bumping it up and down and see where, uh, which, which number gives you the best results. Um, it's not necessarily something you can tell up front. Uh, so that, that might be very easy. If you're using a tool that makes it easy, there's no reason not to. And even if you're not using such a tool, it might be easy enough that it pays off. So uh, we could use better hardware. Uh, on one project uh, four years ago, our build took 24 minutes. Uh, so we, uh, we, and these were fairly high powered laptops. So we f figured out a way to, to give every developer their personal cloud computer. Um, uh, there, Amazon comes with these different types of uh, instances. There, some are called small and some are medium, some are uh, high and then there's like super high, extra high, uh, brilliantly high and so forth. And uh, like depending on how much money you want to spend, you get more computing power. So we were basically uh, uh, giving every developer their private, C, uh, private Amazon instance. And this was a, an eight core computer at the time. I can't remember the name of the instance back then, but eight cores, it cost uh, less than 10 euros a day. Um, so very minimal compared to the, the potential cost of uh, like 24 minute delay be before you actually find out about a problem. Like the first time you make a mistake, uh, you're covered. You paid for the Amazon instance. So, uh, so we made a small, small, small change to our build script that uh, one, if, you, if you've exported an environment variable that's, that points to an Amazon host name, it uh, uploads your local workspace or synchronizes it with that server and then tells the server to run this, the same command that you just typed in and starts like, pushing back the, con the console output. So uh, previously it took 24 minutes to run the build and during those 20 min 24 minutes you couldn't do anything else, not even browse the web uh, because the computer was so bogged down. It was like the CPUs at 100% all the time. Uh, with the, uh, the Amazon instance, you, you like, send off the build. The overhead was uh, less than two seconds to synchronize the, the workspaces, the local workspace with whatever happens to be on the server. Um, and uh, the build time came down to three and a half minutes. From 24 to three and a half, uh, just by using a higher powered computer, probably also faster disk, but that uh, wasn't really a big impact, uh, in, in, at least on our laptops. So clearly paid off. Um, I do have a, an example here, but it's not, not quite the same, uh, same setup. Uh, I, I basically ran, uh, ran the same tests on two different types of uh, Amazon computers and then uh, um, figured out that there's no difference. Uh, there's, there's no real difference, and I didn't want to shell out for the really, really like, high-powered computers. Uh, so I, uh, here's a, a difference between the cloud computer and the laptop, uh, both parallel and uh, sequential. And uh, it seems that actually the, the difference between the, the, my laptop and the cloud instance I was using 
It's not actually that big. It's, uh, we're talking about uh, maybe a bit more than 10% 10, 10 improvement. That's already a lot, but it's not uh, like eight times less. Um, and actually, in this case, it seems that the, a much bigger improvement would be just to parallelize first. And uh, even if, w when you're parallelized and then you push it to the cloud, actually, in, on this instance, or on this, uh, in this project with this code base, it's actually slower to run in the cloud. Um, uh, this has a lot to do with how many cores the, the server had, in this case, just one. So it wasn't parallelizing. Uh, it was faster than the, the local sequential thing, uh, but only because they had uh, a better CPU, not because they were actually parallelizing. So uh, there's a lot uh, you, you could do with the cloud, but you could also do s more stuff with the hardware that most people don't think about. So for example, uh, thinking about disk speeds, you, you probably know that you, ha you get uh, hard drives with different uh, like spinning rates. Some are uh, 5,000 5, plus uh, uh, runs per minute. Some, some disks are 7,200 7, or something like that. Um, uh, some server hardware might have like 15,000 uh, RPM disks. So that, that makes some, uh, some difference. But you also have RAM disks uh, or SSD, solid state drives. Um, that might be a big difference. Uh, the gotcha there is you shouldn't just you know, believe that SSDs are faster and run to the store buying them because modern operating systems actually do a lot of memory mapping already. So unless you do a lot of I.O. on the disk, the SSD drive might not help that much. Um, you could also look at um, uh, the, the kind of uh, the stuff that you usually ignore when you're buying a hard drive, if you're even buying a hard drive nowadays, um, the, the size of the write cache, one megabyte, two megabytes, four megabytes, can make a big difference if you're doing a lot of uh, disk access. So the, the caches are actually important at, in, this, in this level. Uh, you could also look at better software for disks. Um, are you using a 64-bit operating system? Yeah. Have you checked if the operating system and its uh, disk drive has enabled 64-bit access to the disk? Because many vendors have it disabled by default. That might be a big difference as well. Uh, are you using RAID, a RAID array? You can actually use software RAID on, on just a single disk and get uh, uh, an improvement in performance for a certain profile of access. So th there's a lot of things that you, you probably could tweak. Um, it might not be a big difference, but once you get close to the, the potential, any small difference is, uh, is big at that point in time. Also, you could, uh, you could uh, sort of relieve the I.O. bottleneck by using more CPUs. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, most likely the, the sort of... Uh, you don't have a uniform spread of CPU versus I/O access in your in your build. Uh, quite probably, if you look at just your tests, some of them are accessing the disk, and some of them don't at all. So uh, don't make all of the non-disk related tests wait uh, just because some disk accessing test is blocking on the disk access. If you parallelize, this, this uh, should happen sort of automatically, but you might want to make sure that that's happening, that your tests are actually scheduled such, such that one blocking test doesn't stop all the rest. Um, you could, also, of course, use more disks. Uh, you might make, uh, do tricks with uh, just mounting different file systems, if the, even if there's a single, uh, single physical disk. That might make a difference. What's probably even more important is to choose which file system. Uh, on Linux, you have uh, X123, 4, and, and how many different file systems. You have RiserFS, you have this and that. Uh, some of them uh, are better suited at your, your I.O. profile again. So you know, if you have, a sp have spare time, you know, try and uh, change the file, the file system because that might make a difference. 
Um, in summary, there's, uh, there's four things I, I think you should do if you're suffering from a slow build. Uh, first, you know, realize that uh, this is meaningful. If you can't, if, if it's not meaningful, that's actually good news. In that in, kind of it is. It means you have uh, other bigger problems, which doesn't sound that nice. Uh, but at least you, you don't have to like, go into uh, outside of your comfort zone and start tweaking RAID arrays and file systems and uh, the sort of f f things that might be foreign to most programmers. Um, but if you do see that build time is important, profile first. Uh, make sure that the, your code isn't doing stupid things. And take a critical look at how you're running the tests. Because there might be many low-hanging fruits that can give you a big boost in performance. Uh, all of the examples you saw, uh, they're, they're almost trivial to implement. Uh, once you have the dedication to figure it out. Uh, this, is all, uh, this is all open source, free, free uh, software. There's no added cost on, on doing this. It's just the investment in, in the time to figure this out and implement it. Uh, thank you uh, for this. If you have any questions, uh, if you have stories to share, I'd be uh, delighted to hear some of them. And maybe how this relates to, to your environment, which might not be Java. Um, so, uh, I, I, I would reframe that uh, a bit. Uh, so, what, what I'd like to have is the same build for all environments, uh, but I might, uh, I might uh, invoke different parts of it in different environments. So, f for example, uh, in some environments, I have certain, uh, like a different risk profile than, than some other pro uh, environments. If I run uh, locally, uh, now, anything could have happened. I might have broken pretty much anything. Um, but there's also some things that I, I know that even if I've broken this, I wouldn't know just by running things locally because you know, I don't have a cluster environment. I don't have all of the same software stack on my laptop than we have in production. Uh, so there, there are some things that, that just don't make even sense to run on a laptop. Um, so y you might sort of I think of it as uh, like turning off flags in different environments, but I'd like to keep the sort of version control yeah, sense this as the same build, yeah. So th that uh, reminds me of some things that I, I didn't put in th into this presentation. So one is uh, test ordering, uh, like fast test first, so you get uh, like uh, some some known type of certainty very quickly. For example, if you, if you talk about unit tests and integration tests, uh, running all unit tests first fairly quickly, uh, that gives you certainty about what what can I assume safely about the health of the system. Uh, and you know, this is a clear separation. Another uh, way to separate things and sort of uh, stack the, the st or uh, stack the f uh, moments when you get feedback so that you get some of it early is to look at functional uh, functional composition rather than uh, let's say um, technical composition. 
So you might want to run uh, logistics related stuff, including unit tests and, and integration tests first, if that's, that's what information you'd like to get first. For example, I've been working on the logistics stuff. Therefore, most likely, if anything is to break, it's within the logistics stuff. It doesn't mean that I, I haven't broken anything else, but you know, doing this risk management or risk analysis type of thing and deciding what to run first it might make sense in other ways as well. Yeah, so one of the, on this project where we had the 24 minute build, uh, something that we, uh, we tried before that was to modularize the, modularize the build differently. Uh, that actually didn't quite uh, go through. Uh, it, it turned out to be so complicated. Um, I, w I had left the project by then, but they, they had another attempt at this. And uh, this time they had the devotion to actually take it through. And uh, it also re resulted in, ex uh, this particular thing. So uh, since things were more clearly sort of isolated from each other, uh, you had a clearly better way to, to make assumptions and you, know, you, you, would, you could see your risks more clearly. So separation of uh, the modules and clear understanding of dependencies didn't help just the, the build system to figure out what needs to be run and what doesn't, but also help the people uh, decide what what do I want to run and uh, what do I decide to defer. So th uh, also a very good idea. Also for for like people who uh, compile a lot, uh, this this stuff is uh, apparently one of the biggest potentials, uh, s like slicing the build, because like, tweaking the compiler isn't that easy. You probably have to write it yourself. Uh, well, uh, like universally, always, you should, whatever you're doing, you should mock it. Uh, I wouldn't go that far, uh, but uh, I do find mock libraries useful. So uh, uh, I, I I think I agree with you. Um, I would, I'd like to add a small sort of uh, I'm not sure, not sure if it's any different wh than what you're thinking, but uh, um, if there's logic in the database, most likely we we want to test it and we we are testing it somehow. So we have those kind of integration tests that run against a database, some kind of a database, maybe not not the Oracle in production, but something that's similar enough that our our uh, SQL statements work, or, or things like this. And, oh, oh sure. So yeah, we, we're, we've been thrown out. Uh, that's, that's fine. Uh, we're over time. So thank you. And uh, let's continue just outside the door. Uh, all right. Thank you. <laughs>